I don't know if I'd met Brother Robert Fudge before. I feel like I know him. Went to school with his brothers, Edward and Henry. But more than that, when I was growing up, I studied out of the CEI workbooks. And he influenced my life in ways he probably never dreamed that he would <laughs> because he wouldn't have known a little boy in East Texas was reading his material. But it was an honor to be able to get to meet him. I want to say on behalf of the foundation that we appreciate the hospitality you show to us to let us have this lectureship at this place. It's a wonderful facility that you have and we feel honored to be here with you. And I'm thankful that we share the common faith that we do as well. There are three people in my life that it doesn't matter how much I've studied on the subject that I'm studying on, when I get together and talk to them and just talking off the head to them, they know more about it than I have after I've spent months studying. One of them is Steve Wolfgang. He's been a friend of mine uh, ever since we were in Florida College together. Another one is Evan Blackmore, who studies in 17 languages. He wrote our commentary on Leviticus. He's writing the one on Ecclesiastes, and I've read it. He's working on Song of Solomon. I don't see how the man gets all that done because he was a medical doctor that majored in uh, psychiatry, <laughs> and I'm always baffled in his presence. But the third one is Dan King. Dan King was educated at Wayne State University and got his bachelor's degree at David Lipscomb. He went to Harding Graduate School where he earned a master's degree. And at Vanderbilt, he received a PhD in Old Testament language and literature. And he primarily worked in wisdom literature as I understand it. Now, I've been able to preach and do a few things but there are men that have made their career one thing and then they're able to do another career at the same time. He was a financial advisor for 26 years and he probably helped some of you the same as he did to me to get started saving for the times of our retirement. I have edited most of the books Dan has written that circulated among brethren now, he's written professionally in journals that I don't even subscribe to because of the skills that he has. And I know he's taught uh, not only at Florida College, but I think some online courses as well that he's done. But I got to thinking today. He's a graduate from Vanderbilt, and I've edited. Now, that means I've read what he wrote three times. I've edited his Gospel of John commentary, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John commentary, Hebrews, Daniel, James, and he's working on one of Proverbs now. He's written books on I Saw the Heaven Open, which is the simplest and easiest to use commentary on Revelation that I've read. And I've read some commentaries on Revelation. I read the three volume commentary of A-U-N-E. On, is that the way you pronounce it? But at any rate, I read that one. Dan's I preferred. He did a book on Hebrew and Hellenistic thought in the book of wisdom. I read that three times. Responsibility and authority in the spiritual realm at the feet of the master teacher. The days of creation. Searching for happiness. Does God exist? And on top of that, he wrote workbooks in our BTB series on Hebrews, Ezekiel, Song of Solomon, Hebrews, uh, I wrote that down twice, and Revelation. And I got to thinking, you know, if you sit under a professor, that's got to be at least worth 40 hours of, cre of, of university credit. Will you check with Vanderbilt and have them to send me my Ph.D.? <laughs> I've been honored to read his material, and I've learned a lot reading his material. 
And I can assure you that tonight, whenever you leave this building, whenever you finish hearing his lesson on, I believe Jesus rose from the dead, you'll be glad you were here. And a matter of fact, I've attended the lectures since they started, because I was one of the ones that helped start it. But I think this is probably the most thorough presentation of anything we've ever put together. I hope this book lives as I think it deserves to. Dan, come and preach on the resurrection for us tonight. After I heard all of that, I was sitting there thinking, boy, I'd like to listen to this guy. He must be pretty good. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's very appreciated that you are here. Uh, you encourage us by your presence. And we hope it is our prayer that you will go away tonight and say that you are encouraged by something that you have heard. Let me begin, if you will, please, by asking you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Matthew 12, verse 38. I always begin with a text of Scripture. It says, Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now this is a passage that is filled with irony. The irony, of, of course, is the fact that on the one hand, he chides them because they ask for a sign. And if you look at the context of the chapter, you understand why. Because all they're doing is further digging at him, trying to gig him into performing a miracle. Uh, he says to them earlier in verse 34, How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of what the heart is filled with, the mouth speaks. Why is it that they're so evil? Because they are attributing to him a gift from Satan himself. They are saying that he has the devil's power. Beelzebub, the prince of the devil, is the one who is responsible for the miracles that Jesus is performing. Verse 24, look. So what did that say? It said there's no use trying to deal with these people. They're unrealistic. They're dishonest. And he says furthermore that they were uh, trying to kill him. They were really about one piece of business and that's to kill him. In fact, it says down in verse uh, 14 that they had gone out and conspired against him how to destroy him. He knew they did that. He knew those were the people he was talking to. And so he saw them as committing the gift against, or the sin rather, against the Holy Spirit. An unforgivable sin either in this life or in the next. And of course that's a subject that we could talk about at length, but we shan't tonight. Now let me take you to another verse of scripture very quickly. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. He says that Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Did you hear that? Declared to be the Son of God in power or with power according to the spirit of holiness by what? By the resurrection from the dead. That's what the resurrection did. We're going to talk some as we start this evening about believing the unbelievable. 
because I want you to understand that I appreciate the fact, and really all of us do, the fact that resurrection, the idea of a dead body going into the grave and remaining there for three days is rather a certain fate. We understand what that when that happens, we don't expect three days later that this person is going to be alive. After all, he's dead, and dead is dead, right? Well, not in this case. So we're talking here about believing the unbelievable, and so we should not be surprised that even though Jesus uh, repeatedly in Matthew 16 and Mark 8 and Luke 9 and elsewhere told the disciples that he was going to die and be raised again, that they didn't believe it anyway. Now, Peter even chided him on one occasion, Lord, it shall not be so with thee. And remember, Jesus looked at him and said, get behind me, Satan. You're not an encouragement, you're a discouragement. And Peter didn't see himself in that light, but he was, because God had a grander plan in mind. Why is it that the disciples saw it so incredible, and I mean that literally, incredible, not a credible claim? Well, number one, death and resurrection was not an aspect of messianic expectation in first century Judaism. Remember that. We talked about it throughout the week. Various ones have pointed this out. They were looking for a Jewish Messiah figure who was a military man like David who would free them from Roman domination. And so what they expected, they were not getting. That's why they were disappointed. Number two, they had become too familiar with his identity, if you will, as a son of man. Now, this is not unusual or not to be expected. Remember that on various occasions, in fact, there are two specific instances at the synagogue at Nazareth where his own family and friends were shocked by him. It says in Matthew 13, 55, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? We know this guy. They saw him as a son of man and did not truly envisage him in his role as son of God. Number three, they had become too focused upon the ordinary and the natural. Remember that they went to the tomb to anoint the body the women did on that Sunday morning. They were wondering as they made their way who it would was that would roll away the massive stone at the entrance of the tomb. They didn't go there to witness a resurrection even though he had warned them there would be one. And fourth, they failed to understand his mission. They knew he came to save the lost because he said so. But still they waited for the glorious defeat of Roman power, as you might expect. And so later he said to them, how foolish you are, how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Well, not according to their view of the Messiah. And finally in that respect, they allowed fear rather than faith to motivate them. Remember that upon his arrest in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 50, they fled the scene. They were frightened and they left. And then later when Mary Magdalene went to the hidden disciples, they were hiding out, remember, and told them that she had seen him risen, they refused to believe it. It says in Mark 16, 11, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. In Luke 24, 11, their words seemed to them like idle tales, what the women told them, because several women were witnesses of his, his resurrection. They did not believe them. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11, it says in Mark 16, 14, as they were eating 
And he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he'd risen. So it's understandable even today that many people are rather cautious about this notion of believing in someone who apparently rose from the dead. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to appreciate the importance of the resurrection conceptually and doctrinally. And in this regard, let me go to the words of the apostle Peter in Acts chapter two, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did by him in your midst, even as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because, and here's the critical part, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he cites David. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he's at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. Well, that's a bold series of proclamations. And I want to talk tonight some as more or less the body of our message because I realized that what I wrote was quite long. You haven't seen anything yet because I took that and made it into a book. So that's ho hopefully pretty shortly going to be seen as well. But, and it's much longer there than it was before. But I want to talk with you here about the hard evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Because here we're talking about, as I said already, something that is truth, but is stranger than fiction. If I were to tell you that someone whom I had known was dead and now is alive, you would probably not believe me. As a general rule, you would say, I don't believe it. And Truly, I would expect that would be the case. And yet, let me say to you tonight that the world's largest religion is Christianity. And the heart and soul of that religion is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. You see that picture? Let that imprint it itself upon your mind for a moment. Those there, they are the victims of ISIS. Every one of those men that you see in that portrait is now dead. You see the guy in the center with the knife up? Every one of those men was carrying a knife. Every throat there was slashed. Every one of those men bled out, died, and was buried, and now awaits the resurrection. Even though what we're talking about tonight is truly an incredible thing to believe. Nevertheless, hundreds of millions of perfectly sane, perfectly intelligent, and very capable at times human beings are convinced in this modern age that this is accurate and it really did happen. Pamela Bennings Ewan, a legal professional who specializes in international law, authored a book called Faith on Trial. Her special investigation involved the value of the witness testimony in the gospel narratives as to whether or not it was sufficient to prove the case of the resurrection of Jesus in a court of law. In this regard, she said, in law, the key to proof of a case is evidence. The stronger 
the better the case. Direct testimony of an eyewitness is not essential to prove a case. Evidence of circumstances that combine to lead to a conclusion can also be very convincing. But testimony of an eyewitness who is found to be credible is extremely convincing. And the statements of two credible eyewitnesses that are consistent in material respects, if not expressly controverted, require belief. Now she goes on. She makes a wonderful case here. She says, verifiable evidence of the historical fact of the life and crucifixion of Jesus has been presented to the jury. Now this is toward the end of her book after she's presented all the evidence. And she summarizes by saying, looking back over the horizon of history, you've seen that references to his life were preserved in writings of many non-Christian historians from the period beginning immediately after his death and throughout the following centuries, including Tacitus, Suetonius, Josephus, Pliny the Younger, Trajan, Thallus, and in the Talmud. Further proof is supplied by numerous Christian writers of the period and by extensive archaeological evidence and other evidence that corroborates the fact of his existence and the manner of his death. In fact, the evidence that has been presented to the jury corroborates almost every single detail by which the historical and social context of the testimony has been created. But it's the claim of resurrection that provides the greatest authentication to the special nature of Jesus. That claim is based upon the actual testimony of the gospel witnesses. We've seen that federal law holds that direct eyewitness testimony is powerful evidence not to be easily disregarded. The inference of truth of the facts to be proved by that testimony depends upon the truthfulness or credibility of the witness. The witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, have testified through the gospels that they and hundreds of others observed the crucifixion and the resurrection that they saw and they spoke with Jesus at this time and he appeared in recognizable form after his death and that their relationships with him continued after his physical death. <clears throat> she concludes by saying when she talks about the verdict, in a criminal trial, the jury must find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Adapting even that higher standard of proof for our purposes, if you, the jury, were to actually hear the testimony in court of not one but four different witnesses whom you believe to be honest and truthful as to their observation that an event had occurred, occurred would you not believe that the event had occurred? Consider further how the testimony would be weighed if each witness was consistent in all material respects with others and if collateral details of the testimony were all verified by corroborative evidence. Finally, add to that the circumstantial evidence that many people in the communities in which these witnesses lived changed their conduct in a manner that was consistent with the testimony. The level of proof is much stronger. And that is the level of proof that has been presented in this case. Now let me list several evidences that are presented in the New Testament to prove the case for Jesus. And again, this is very solid evidence. Number one, there's the evidence of the Old Testament predictions about him. Now, I shall not go into this topic in great depth because mostly, I think, most people are aware of it. And it is quite extensive. It is a subject that, that you could spend a great deal of time on. But just let me mention Psalm 1610, which we saw quoted a moment ago by the Apostle Peter. This great hymn of trust in the Lord as David's 
Redeemer and Savior, exudes confidence that God will not abandon him, even in the darkest hours of his life. For you will not leave your, my soul in Sheol, the place of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Like all other texts of this kind, there have been detractors who would limit the words of the King of Israel to temporal mortal danger. They tell us David could not have meant to say any more than that he was to be rescued from great danger. Certainly the original setting of this sentence of the prophet would likely have been some situation where mortal danger was a threat to the life of the writer, but a common characteristic of such sayings as have a secondary meaning in relation to the messianic king is that they speak in words that seem to transcend the historical moment and the general circumstance wherein they were spoken. This is absolutely the case in this instance. Clearly David speaks of his possessing a hope that his soul would not be left or abandoned. The Hebrew word is azav in that realm to which the departed dead are assigned. What David longs for here is more than just relief from momentary danger. He cries out in his prayer for the Lord to help him to overcome death. What he envisions was resurrection. By using the words, your holy one, he did not speak of himself. He spoke beyond himself. A reference to the coming king, King Messiah. Psalm 22 and Psalm 69 and Isaiah 53. Remember in Acts 8, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other? Yes, some other. And the Bible says that beginning at that verse, Philip spoke to him about Jesus and preached the gospel to him. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, there are very many texts of scripture. Even on the cross, our Savior cried out, and said, Eli, Eli, lama zevachtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Speaking the Hebrew words of Psalm 22, verse 1. Not just quoting, but living it. Living every moment of it. Crying out to God for help. A study in and of itself, but we have not time to linger long. Number two, as far as the evidences, would be the so-called displaced stone. There was a stone that was over that tomb. How did it get moved? You know, many of the tombs in Palestine were hollowed out of soft limestone rock that was so prevalent in the region. A low doorway was left for access into a man-made cave. Outside the door well, doorway and parallel to the wall of the tomb, a narrow inclined groove was cut into the rock where a large circular stone, always quite heavy, was rolled into place to secure the grave against looters and grave robbers. That was a good business in those days because like often today, people get buried with their precious possessions at times. But some of those stones, because of that problem of looters and robbers, were very heavy. Some weighed over a ton. And while the tomb was vacant, the stone was held at one side by a cleat or a small block that jammed beneath it. After a body had been placed in the grave, all they did was just pulled out the cleat or the block and the stone rolled into its place. But if you want to get it out of there... That's another matter. Of the more than 900 second temple period burial caves that have been discovered around Jerusalem and examined by archaeologists, Amos Cloner, a very prominent one, he said and observed that only four have been discovered with this disc-shaped blocking stone like the one described in the story of the burial of Jesus. 
These four very elegant Jerusalem tombs belonged to the wealthiest people in the city. In certain instances, they were people of royalty, certainly wealthy families, such as the well-known stone of, and the tomb of Queen Helena of Adiabene. More frequently, a square or cork-shaped blocking stone was used. It was also heavy, but much less so, and certainly much less expensive. Now, this made a very effective barrier against vandalism or robbery. And the Bible tells us that the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, where the corpse of Jesus was placed, was made after that fashion and is so described in the accounts. It says in Matthew 28, 2, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat upon it. So the gospel accounts, all four of them, tell us how it got moved in some fashion or another. In Mark 16, 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, says Luke 24, 2. And John 21 says, 20 and 1, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So the tomb had been sealed. It had been guarded around the clock. So who moved the stone? Merrill Tenney writes, the tomb could not have been opened without incurring serious risk of immediate detection and prosecution. A handful of disorganized disciples or the timid cottery of women could scarcely have removed the body if it were watched by an armed band. Matthew also asserts that the removal of the stone was witnessed by the guards who were terrified by the angelic messenger and that they immediately hastened into the city. That means they ran away. They're scared to death to report this weird occurrence to the chief priests. Matthew 28, 11 and 12. When the women reached the garden early on the first day of the week, the stone had already been rolled aside. They were surprised to find that it had been removed and that there was ready access to the burial chamber. Remember that they went there wondering, how are we going to get in it? Who's going to move the stone for us? But there it was already moved. And so he makes several observations. He says, number one, Jesus was clearly buried in a tomb that was hollowed out of living rock. All four gospels say so. Number two, a large circular stone was rolled in front of it. All the gospels say so. Number three, the women realized if they were to complete their sad errand, remember they went to dress the body for burial, they couldn't do that on Friday, so they did that on Sunday morning, which would be our Sunday morning, the day after the Sabbath. Then somebody would have to open the door to the tomb. Number four, they did not expect to find it open. They did not go to witness a resurrection. They went to dress a dead body. That must be remembered. Number five, when they did, the discovery was a distinct shock to them. If the disciples had plotted to remove the body as the Sanhedrin had feared, the women had no knowledge of the plan. Certainly they had not the strength to accomplish such a task themselves, nor had they anticipated an attempt. The disciples could not have opened the tomb without becoming involved in an armed clash with guards. Even if they would forced their way into the sepulcher, their action would have been reported to the authorities. And it would have been the cause for immediate arrest and prosecution. Of course, you know, if they'd had an opportunity to do that, they would have done it. So who moved the stone? No answer unless God removed it by his angels, like the Bible says. Number three, there's the empty tomb. The four gospels set forth a unanimous narrative that proclaims that the body of Jesus disappeared from its resting place. Where'd it go? Matthew's report says, the angel answered, he's not here, he's risen. 
Even as he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. In other words, come, see the evidence. And the imperfect tense of the Greek word lay, akato, was lying or used to lie, implies the body had been laid there upon the stone shelf inside the tomb, but it's no longer there. Luke kind of differs by stating that the women entered in, but found not the body of the Lord Jesus, 24-3. John gives the impression that Mary Magdalene's report of the absence of Jesus' body preceded her personal investigation of the interior of the tomb in chapter 21 and 2. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is precisely the type of incidental differences that professional investigators come to expect from various witness reports that are told by different parties who have not attempted to create a consistent narrative through collusion. The stories sound contradictory at first, but when they're examined carefully in context, it's seen that, that they simply are told from different perspectives by those who are unaware of what others may have seen or said or done in their absence. Now, it's not their responsibility under such circumstances to explain what others might have seen or experienced. Each person tells his own or her, I might add, own story in their own words and so gives their own version of what happened. Mary probably saw that the stone had been moved and concluded that the body was gone without looking inside it first. Peter and John, on the other hand, followed after her venture to the place and actually looked inside the chamber and corroborated her deduction. Later on, she and the other women may have gathered courage and gone inside also. At any rate, the uniform testimony of those who visited the tomb that Sunday morning was that it was untenanted when they visited it. And this provides powerful confirmation that there had been a physical resurrection. The subsequent appearances would seem to justify their immediate conclusion. So on the face of it, the theory that Jesus did not actually die on, on the cross, or, but merely swooned into a, a comatose state for a time, <coughs> and then, pardon me, was resuscitated in the face of it is ludicrous. The eyewitness detail of the soldier who drove his lance through the side of Jesus, along with the description of the blood and water, which was coagulated blood and serum, attesting that his body was either already in a state of decomposition, or as some medical authorities have argued, that the spear had pierced the fluid-filled sac or pericardium that surrounds the heart, John 19, 33 to 35. So flowing from his wounds, it shows that even when they thought that the Lord was dead, nevertheless, they made every effort to be certain that this man was dead. The Romans were professional killers. These men did this every day. This was their work. He was, in fact, dead. It was not a question whether or not. All scholars and intellectuals of any true merit whatsoever consider that Jesus died and was buried. The facts of the case are virtually undeniable. In my book, I deal with the only instance where anybody ever survived a crucifixion in the ancient world. And there were two men who were rescued by, by, from the cross, from a cross, a Roman cross. And, one of, and both of them were then superintended by a physician. One of them died before the day was up. And the other fellow was very, very ill for several days, but eventually recovered. But that was because he was taken off the cross while he was still alive and showed signs of life. This is not something that happened in this instance. Number four, there is a huge host of believable witnesses and their doc documents that need to be understood and examined. Now, when you think about 
how we know things historically, and this is very crucial, I believe, to any investigation of this sort. Not one of us, for example, knows from personal experience, so to say, or memory that Alexander the Great, who lived from 356 to 323 BC, ever lived or that he conquered all the armies of the great civilizations of his day. We don't know that from personal experience. We all probably know it, but we know it because we trust the historical records about him. At the same time, it needs to be appreciated that the historical records about this important figure, every one of them, are from hundreds of years after that man lived. The earliest of the histories that tell us about Alexandria, Alexander was penned by Diodorus Siculus from Agira in Sicily who lived from 60 to 30 B.C. That's 300 years later. There are no contemporaneous, contemporaneous documents that attest the existence of such a man as Alexander the Great. And yet all of us believe it. And in fact, we would call any person who denied it a fool. And we would be right to say that. Let me tell you this. The documents about Jesus were all written within 50 years. And many of them by eyewitnesses. Luke, I think, is the most powerful of all. And the reason I subscribe to that notion is because Luke went to Palestine, the homeland of the Jews, he was there for a period of some two years and undoubtedly asked witness after witness after witness. And he does an interesting thing in many instances, by the way. He names people who probably are still alive and can be talked to. Oftentimes, he'll just exclude somebody and says, this is what happened, doesn't give the name. And that probably signifies that person is dead now. And so you can't go talk to him. But it's interesting, you see that same sort of thing in many instances in the Gospels where someone like Cleopas is named. Why does he name him and not the other guy? Because probably 50 years have now passed and that fellow is probably dead by now. But Cleopas is still alive. You can go talk to him. And that's the whole point of a lot of these things. So what we say about this sort of thing is we're dealing in this instance with a source of knowledge where there are a number of factors that are important in the process of deliberation and assessment. For example, when we talk about eyewitness testimony, we're, there are several things we talk about. Number one, we talk about the honesty and the motive of the witness. We talk about the ability of the witness to know the facts. If he was there, he could know the facts. If he wasn't, he couldn't. The agreement of the witness with the testimony of other eyewitnesses to the identical event. In other words, if they're telling basically the same story, you'd say, well, they were there. And then there's the consistency of the witness with experience, our own experience. There's certain things that we will not believe because we've not experienced things of that kind. And then there's the coincidence of their testimony with what we call collateral circumstances. That is, there are many things that look and sound correct. Now, there's a, a particular writer that, if you've never read the writings of this particular fellow, a German Jew by the name of uh, Pincus Lapida. Uh, he was a leading Orthodox German Jew a few years ago, announced his acceptance of the resurrection of Jesus, not as an invention of the early church, as so many of his contemporaries believed, but as a factual historical event. He made this announcement to the dismay of a great many of his fellow scholars. What he had done is he had done a very careful study and he listed what he called the traces of authentic Jewish experience to be found in the gospel accounts of the resurrection. Here are the factors he talked about. He said, in a purely fictional narrative, one would have avoided making the women the crowning witnesses of the resurrection since they were considered in rabbinic, rabbinic Judaism as incapable of giving valid testimony. The circumstance that the same women 
wanted to anoint the dead Jesus right after his burial as Jewish custom demanded proves that basically none of the disciples nor the women themselves expected his resurrection. Even more eloquent is the silence of the evangelists concerning the resuscitation of the dead Nazarene. How easy it would have been for them or their immediate successors to supplement this scandalous hole in their concatenation of events by fanciful embellishments. He said, I looked for them, can't find them. They're not there. He further wrote, when this scared band of apostles, which just to, uh, were just about to throw everything away in order to flee in despair to Galilee, when these peasants, shepherd, fishermen, who betrayed and denied their master and then failed him miserably, suddenly could be changed overnight into a confident mission society, convinced of salvation and able to work with much more success after Easter than before. Then he said, in the same way, all resurrections and resuscitations, which the Bible and rabbinical literature speak, happen only in the presence of a few people, as in this case. He said, thus, the small number of witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus is not an obstacle to the Easter faith, but on the contrary, speaks for the authenticity of that salvation experience in Judaism almost two millennia ago. In regard, and this is key, he said, in regard to the future resurrection of the dead, I am and remain a Pharisee. Concerning the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday, I was for decades a Sadducee. I am no longer a Sadducee. I accept the resurrection of Jesus not as an invention of the community of disciples, but as an historical event. What did he do? He just examined the evidence. And he was convinced. Number five, the condition of the grave clothes. The gospel accounts seem to underscore the presence and condition in the empty tomb of certain linen cloths that were used to prepare the corpse, corpse for burial. Whatever happened to the body, the materials used for his burial were left there intact in the tomb. Now, if you think about it, why would the disciples steal away the body and unwrap it before they took it out? It was a dead body. If they're going to tell people, why wouldn't they just leave it wrapped? If that's the case, then if that's what you're trying to do, you would never think to do that. So what happened? What caused those, those wrappings to be left? Because of the late hour and the impending Sabbath, the procedure was carried out probably very quickly using a single linen sheet to drape the body overall. And this would have saved time under the circumstances, although the Johannine account in 1940 of John seems to make room for the additional use of certain swaths or cloths or bandages as well. Probably both were employed even though they were applied, in this case, very hastily. Now, you'll remember that when Lazarus was risen, the Bible says he came out of the grave bound hand and foot. So Jesus was probably similarly wrapped. Now, there's an interesting here, there's a reference to a certain sudarion that was later found rolled up in a place by itself in John 20, verse 7. So when we take these accounts together, they seem to indicate the body was wrapped probably up to the torso with the main wrappings, and the head may have been encased separately with a napkin, which would have been left in the place where the head had lain prior to rising. On the other hand, a larger shroud may have been placed over the smaller wrappings to cover the whole body in the fashion of the so-called Shroud of Turin, although the authenticity of that sacred relic, as it's been called, has always been rather questionable. When the disciples saw the place where the Lord was laid on the morning of the resurrection, the two wrapping media were separate from each other, apparently just as they had been at the time of the interment. This suggests that the Lord had either laid aside the head covering or else the resurrection body passed directly through these claws that enshrouded him. 
And it's uncertain exactly how that worked. But the point is, the phenomena suggest a sudden disappearance of the body. And it's not a mystery that is easy to explain in naturalistic terms. Ordinary explanations simply will not work in this case. The hypothesis that suggests Jesus was resurrected, however, explains them perfectly. Number six, there is the multiplicity and the variety of the appearances. Different times, different places, as well as different individuals and groups. As we consider the appearances of the Lord to the disciples, it must first be observed that these people were not in expectation of a resurrection. Even though Jesus warned them repeatedly, it was his plan. In fact, it should also be remembered that the disciples were themselves quite critical of initial reports about his being resurrection, resurrected and they refused to take it seriously. That is obvious from Luke 24, 11, Luke 24, 23, Luke 24, 23, or 24, and Luke 24, verse 41, as well as John 20 and 25. So the generic statement you could make in regard to these people is that none of them believed it. At first, nobody was convinced except Mary Magdalene and the other ladies who were there. Now, if you've ever asked the question of yourself, why did the Lord make women his first witnesses? The answer, I think, is quite simple. These women followed him to the cross. Everybody else pretty much fled. Now, I could be wrong about that, but that's my supposition. And I'm sticking to it because I believe it's right. I think they deserved to be the first witnesses because they stuck to him right to the end. Now, if we were to suppose that the appearances of Jesus to these frightened disciples in the days after the crucifixion were to be explained on the basis of some psychological predilection or emotional anticipation, then we would certainly expect that the times and the places and the general circumstances of those encounters would be significant. But you'd be wrong. There are all kinds of different places. They seem to be rather random and not associated with any particular place or time, except that the appearances on the first day of the week, our Sunday, do seem to have some special appearance since they're associated with that unique day of later Christian worship. But there were approximately 13 resurrection appearances, and different scholars have numbered them differently. But let me just quickly run through a few of them. He appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden, where she at first mistook him as the gardener in Mark 6 and in John 20. Number two, he was seen by Salome and Mary, the mother of James, and Joseph after Mary Magdalene ran on ahead to tell the other disciples in Matthew 28, 9 to 10, it tells us that. Unlike the first Mary, they recognized him immediately, ran to him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. Number three, he appeared to Peter. Now, this is interesting because we're told this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 4 to 8, and Luke mentions it in Luke 24, 34. But there's no, it apparently was a private interview, and Peter never told us about exactly how it happened or where or how. Number four, several hours after his resurrection on Sunday morning, Jesus appeared to two men walking on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus in Luke 24. One of the men's name is Cleopas. As I mentioned, that probably, because the other fellow is unnamed, probably suggests he's already dead. But it's interesting because this is a lengthy conversation that takes, uh, that takes place between the parties. And this is one of the facts of the case is that you see in very many of these appearances, Jesus talking to people at great length. That's not what happens in so-called visions or hallucinations, as some people argue. That never happens. And so we also see him on several occasions break bread with them and eat fish and so forth. Sometimes they recognize him and apparently sometimes not. And interestingly, he was able to just vanish from their sight, which is an amazing thing. 
which suggests, I believe, to us that his resurrection body, even though it was a physical body, was somehow different, more glorified, as the Bible uses the terminology. That's to be expected. Expected. Number five, at Jerusalem, he appeared to all the apostles except Thomas in John 20, 19 to 25. Now, this happened apparently on the evening of the first Sunday. He'd risen that morning. He appeared to the apostles that night. Ten people were there. Again, Thomas was missing. When he appeared, he casually agreed, greeted them with shalom, erene su in Greek. And then he goes off. And the Bible says that they were at first terrified, thinking he was a ghost. The doors were locked, so he appeared in their midst, which in itself is an interesting feature. He calmed their fears, however, and offered them the opportunity to touch him. He said, look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. This is important. One week later, all 11 gathered. This time Thomas is there. John 20, 24 to 29. When Thomas had been told that previous week about what had happened, he became doubting Thomas, didn't he? And he said, no, I don't believe it. I won't believe it until I see it. So Jesus appears there. Unless I see the nails and prints in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Verse 25. Again, the doors were locked when they assembled, but once more, Jesus appeared in the midst of them, greeted them in his customary way with his shalom. Then he directed his gaze right at Thomas and he offered him his hands and his feet. And Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. He was real. Number seven, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he appeared also to seven of the disciples, including five of the apostles, Peter, Thomas, Didymus, Nathaniel, or Bartholomew, the brothers James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and two other unnamed disciples, which may again suggest to us those disciples are now deceased. At the time of the appearance, they were fishing in the boat close to shore. They fished all through the night with no luck. At first, they didn't know this unidentified figure on the shore until he asked them whether they'd taken anything, and they said no. And he said, put the, put the net on the other side of the boat. And he did, they did, and they did so and hauled in 153 big ones. And having remembered what had happened one time previously, the Bible says, Peter, John said, it's the Lord. And Peter jumped in the water to go see him. Couldn't wait to see him. Now, in this private event, a long discourse took place, a discussion that John was a witness to. And he reports a long conversation with give and take with both parties. Again, not the phenomena that you expect in a so-called hallucination or vision of some sort. On still another occasion, he appeared to over 500 brethren at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. The precise nature of that assemblage is unknown. Isn't that interesting? 500 people were there, and yet it was so taken as a fact of life that they didn't report the details of it. It makes me so curious, my skin crawls. And maybe you too. I want so much to know about it. But it's taken as a fact of life. And everyone knows it. And then we go to number 10. He appeared to his brother James, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Now, if, if James made his home in Nazareth, then the meeting may have been there. But this is interesting. Have you ever studied Mark 3.21 in the Greek? Those preachers who read Greek, I suggest you read it sometime. The, the word hoi par autu 
refers to his family, those who were close to him, not his, not his friends, because later on his family shows up. And here's what it said. It, it goes on to use the Greek verb krateo, meaning that they were coming to manhandle him. They're coming to get him. And probably, I would say, James was very likely the one who was leading the pack to get him. Now, why? Because it says at the end of the verse, haughty ex aste, which is ex histome, histome or, which simply means he was beside himself. We use that expression ourselves, except it means outside of himself in the Greek, ex histeme, outside of himself. He was crazy. They thought he was a loon. They went there to get him and take him. In. And so I've often just kind of pictured in my mind this thought of them getting there. We're going to take him. We're taking him back. He's crazy, obviously. And I can imagine Peter and Simon the zealot, who were, I'm sure were the two carrying the, the, the blades with them, the swordsmen. Probably both of them uh, patriots. You're not taking him anywhere. It doesn't tell us about it. But again, my curiosity is so wedded. Why didn't they try to take him? They didn't. Apparently nothing came of it. But the Bible says they came there with the intent to take him in hand, krateo, and make him come back home. Didn't happen. Interesting, is it not? But then we have James... The same guy becomes his disciple because the Bible says Jesus appeared to James. That explains it all. James knew he was dead. James knew that they saw him crucified. And yet James, and then the Bible says all the brothers, the whole family were now his followers in Acts 1. What did that? One thing, resurrection. Resurrection did that. That's the only way in the world such a thing could have happened. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me just take a couple of minutes to talk to you about, about resurrection, our future hope. In the book, I have a number of points that I make in regard to this. And I think about a couple of stories in my own life, if you'll indulge me just a moment. The first experience that I remember with death was my Uncle Sam. When Uncle Sam was taken in, in those days, I lived out in the country, and people didn't go to funeral homes out in the country. They carried the body in a coffin and set it in the house, and you visited in the living room. They would shove aside, some of you remember it, I can see you. You're, yes, you've done it too. They would put the body in the living room, and the friends would come by and visit, and that would be the deal. Well, that was my first, my Uncle Sam. I loved him better than anything. I was about four or five years old. Uncle Sam died, and my dad took me into the room and said, would you like to see Uncle Sam? And I said, yes. And there he lay, long white beard, white as a sheet, no blood at all, just a corpse and it left an impression upon me but then the second recollection I have now Uncle Sam was not a Christian let me say that to you Uncle Sam was not a Christian there was no joy at that funeral years later my parents took me along with all of us boys we went to see one of the elders of the church had just passed away and we attended that funeral. And prior to the funeral, there was a wake, as we called it. I don't know what wake means, but you stand around and you talk to the family and so forth and you stay awake. The people stayed awake, I guess, back in those days. But we went to, to see them and the family was sitting around. I'll never forget walking into that room. They were laughing and talking. just like it was a wonderful day. It was, don't you see? It was because 
a, a godly man had gone to be with the Lord. And I wanted that. And I suggest if you don't have it, you get it too. I want it. And I've lived my life in such a way I hope to have it. But let me tell you again about this business we're talking about. There's a reason why people do this sort of thing. That's a lineup of martyrs. Those people had their throats cut moments later by ISIS rebels. Their, their crime, they were Christian. Why would someone die when a person comes to them and says, listen, all you gotta do is become a Muslim. If you'll become a Muslim, then you can be saved. We'll, we'll let, we won't kill you. And every one of those men up there, every one of them said, no, I'm a Christian. Now why? Because they believe that on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. That's why people, they have, and I want you to take that memory with you as we leave tonight. People, these completely sane, modern people, who have computers and, and cell phones and, and are thoroughly modern people still believe that many centuries ago a man walked out of a grave because he was the son of God and it declared as Paul says in Romans 1 4 it mightily declared that he was the son of 